Good evening. And I promise you this is the last conversation before we break for dinner and uh, in, celebrate the end of two and a half days of great discussions. Um, and the last conversation has uh, incredible gentlemen uh, discussing uh, the future. Uh, we've had uh, very engaging discussions on what's happening today, the responses we need for the developments of the past. This panel is going to look ahead. Uh, in some ways, the last two days tell us of three distinct developments over the past decade. Uh, one, of course, is the breakdown of divisions. I think the neat packaging of continents are no longer as relevant of the regions and sub-regions are no longer as effective. And we have seen uh, geographies merge and their politics uh, in many ways contest, sometimes complement each other. We've also seen the neat packaging of the digital and the real collapse. I think both implicate each other. The, the cyber world is a real world. It has real world consequences. And of course, the real world feeds off and feeds into the digital. We've also seen, in some ways, uh, the the believers and the non-believers on the globalization debate getting conflated. I think the biggest defenders of the global project today are also, in many ways, those who believe something has gone wrong with that project. So the, the neat packaging of constituencies who believed in integration and globalization versus those who opposed it is also a little confusing today. And in that sense, uh, what we discussed today uh, is now going to take, use these as a point of departure looking ahead. I'm going to first start with uh, the Indian Foreign Secretary, Mr. Vijay Gokhale, and ask him uh, to identify the key challenges and trends uh, over the next decade that are going to implicate his job and his successor's job and or that of the Foreign Service, and also uh, the solutions, the partnerships, uh, and perhaps uh, the responses that may need to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Um, well, I mean, there are so many challenges that we have to face in the next 10 or 15 years, but I would really put it down to three of them. I think the first is uh, what uh, Datosti Anwar Ibrahim referred to, the, uh, the challenge between unilateralism on the one side and multilateralism on the other. And of course, a subset of that also is that there are also new and different concepts of multilateralism. So. Uh, is it that national interest becomes the sole determinant of how we act mm -hmm. uh, uh, and interact with others? Or is it that we act and interact in a group? And if we do, do we do it on the basis of the current multilateral system, which is established after the Second World War, and which is not necessarily reflective of today's realities? Or do we deal with new concepts, such as, for instance, China's concept of the community for the shared future of mankind? So I think that's a challenge, and, and uh, in a sense, the developments of the last two years have really uh, shown that this is a challenge which is imminent. I'd say a second challenge is really industry 4.0 versus jobs. I'd put it that way. Uh, you have a huge benefit which comes out of the fourth industrial revolution. But uh, is, the question is for a country like India, is the manufacturing wave over? Are we in an era of jobless growth? And if we are in an era of jobless growth, how do we ensure that we grow on the one hand and maintain uh, social stability on the other? Uh, and this, uh, you know, you will remember when uh, um, uh, one of the Western leaders asked Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping what the greatest contribution China had made to the world, and he said the greatest contribution is our development, because otherwise the scale of migration that you will see will make a tea party of what we have seen so far. Uh, I, he, could, he said, I could offer you 10 million or 100 million. So I think this applies to India today as well, uh, because uh, you know, there is a contradiction between uh, uh, Industry 4.0 and jobs. The third, I think, and, and this is a, a, an issue I feel is very strongly about, it is science versus ethics. Uh, we have a world of technology today with a great capacity to do good. Technology delivers to the underprivileged, to the poor, to the backward. It allows the people who have aspirations to see and do things. But at what point is it regulated by ethics? I mean, do we have genetically engineered babies? Do we uh, use technology to subvert the state of another country? Uh, do we use technology to um, uh, disenfranchise a population or in enhance inequalities? Is it a new 
sort of colonialism between the haves and the has nots, and who gets to decide the ethics and who gets to make the rules. So I really put these as uh, challenges. Very uh, briefly, as partnerships, I, th I think the G20 should be a global rule-making partnership. I would say the Indo-Pacific partnerships, which is a regional compact for global growth, this is where growth is going to take place. And I'd say uh, at, a, at a philosophical level, a partnership between science and the humanities, we have to bring humanities back front and center in the education sector. It can't just be technology. I'll stop there. Let me talk to, uh, turn to Mark Sedwell. Uh, Industry 4.0 versus jobs. The good news for India is that you are the first uh, uh, in, you know, first users in many ways of these new technologies and you're already facing uh, some degree of resistance uh, once you have deployed these. Uh, what would your assessment be towards, uh, you know, to the big challenges and trends that are causing you some anxiety as you sit in your office and of course what are the solutions you are thinking of? Well, thank you, Samir, and thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. I suspect uh, you'll find we are uh, picking up many of the same things, themes and I will uh, um, uh, be picking up a couple of the points that uh, the Foreign Secretary has just made. I think the, bi the biggest challenge is the, uh, is the 21st century global order and the shift of economic power uh, into the Indo-Pacific Indo and online into cyberspace. We need to start thinking of cyberspace not as a thing but as a place. Correct. It's a place people live their lives, do business and of course in which Threats can, uh, threats can happen. And those two things are happening uh, in parallel. Uh, second is the fourth industrial revolution, uh, uh, as we've heard. And it's a very easy term to use that. But if you actually think about what it means, it is, of course, the, uh, the uh, uh, growth of e-commerce and of people uh, having economic security, social relationships in cyberspace. But it's also artificial intelligence, machine learning, autonomous technology, uh, and it will change the pattern of societies probably more profoundly than any of the previous industrial rev revolutions except for the first, which drove um, the growth in populations, the growth in urbanization, uh, and uh, uh, major social and economic trends. And the fourth industrial revolution uh, offers to do that in unpredictable ways uh, in, the 21st, uh, in the 21st century. The third is that we need to remember uh, that there, are, there remain large um, numbers of people uh, and uh, some countries, uh, the third I would call is disaffection, and some countries and some individuals who are disaffected from the era of globalization, either because they have an ideological aversion to it uh, and they believe it is somehow uh, violating their uh, traditions and sense uh, of identity, or in the cases of some nations, because they believe they're being left behind uh, uh, by it, or in the cases of cohorts of some of our citizens, particularly after the 2008 crash, they discover that the era of globalization w didn't really suit uh, their opportunities, and they've reacted uh, against it. And so we, still, we will still have to deal with threats that emanate from malign states, uh, failed states, uh, fragile states, which are subject to corrupt governance or weak governance, or in some cases, no governance. Um, what's the answer to that? Well, uh, the answer to that is partnerships, that second question you put to us. And I will just really boil it down into one simple point. There needs to be a partnership between all countries that are committed to the global rule of law. We will have different ways of organizing ourselves politically and economically, but there needs to be a commitment to the global rule of law. And if we think back, we, we started to develop international law. I want to just refer to two examples, really. We started to develop international law in the 17th and 18th centuries, largely in the maritime domain, as the, in the, as the first era of global commerce took off, uh, and as it became apparent that in the maritime domain there needed to be some kind of governance mechanism for, um, in that case, a, a, uh, 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 regions that were beyond the capacity of national governments to regulate. Uh, the UK was heavily involved in that at the time. The Royal Navy um, was in this part of the world um, and many other parts of the world, uh, wiping out slavery, cracking down on piracy and so on. Well, of course, we're doing exactly the same in the 21st century, including in the maritime domain. Just in uh, the last couple of months, uh, a, a, a Royal Navy operation in 24 hours protected over 70 Indian vessels, 
um, uh, that, were, uh, that were at risk of uh, piracy. And so we established the principle several, two centuries ago of free and safe navigation in an area that was out with the governance of individual nations, and that was the, really the beginnings of the international legal system and the global order of that era. Where in the 21st century, not only do we have to protect that and continue to crack down on the modern manifestations of slavery and piracy and so on, but we have to take that same example into the region of cyberspace. Because cyberspace is also out with the control of individual nations. It's a global, uh, it's a global entity. And we need to find means to govern and regulate cyberspace without uh, that impeding upon uh, the economic benefits we get from globalization uh, 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 that, that, uh, that operates in that area. And that's going to mean a partnership between nations committed to the rules-based system and the global rule of law. In terms of a prediction, final point, um, by the middle of the 21st century, um, I think we'll succeed. I think we will be able to uh, uh, form that uh, partnership between nations committed to the global rule of law. I think the world, as it has been over the last 50 years, it's, it's, in, it's inevitable in um, fora like this that we focus on some of the challenges and problems. But actually, we need to remember the world is wealthier and it's safer than it was 50 years ago. And I believe it will be wealthier and safer in 50 years' time. But it will also be more unequal. And there will still be pockets where people are... Uh, subject to disaffection, deprivation, extreme poverty, uh, abuse, criminality, terrorism. And those will be those same pockets that are subject now to weak governance or corrupt governance uh, or no governance. And countries committed to the global rule of law, countries committed to the rules-based system like the countries you see here, countries with a global uh, tradition and outlook like mine and like the other uh, countries uh, on the stage, mustn't turn our backs on those and we must remain committed to ensuring that the rules-based system um, actually uh, creates a, a, a global uh, order that works for every country and every uh, one of our citizens. Uh, let me move to the Secretary General um, from France, sir. Um, Paris, uh, France has had a very interesting year. I think the Paris Peace Forum in many ways uh, was a call for creating solutions, for bringing together uh, leaders and, and seeking collective action on some of the most pressing, pressing challenges. And towards the end of the year, you saw uh, the new politics emerge on the streets and, and, and push back against that entire framework of globalization itself. The, uh, to fund collective action, uh, you saw there was street protest uh, in, in, in some ways. I'm putting it simply, but to just make it provocative. Sitting in Paris, uh, being the leader of that continent, you know, trying to create uh, a new order, what would you think the three or four critical issues that you, uh, 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 in the next 10 years, what would be the three or four issues you would need to respond to? Thank you very much for uh, presenting the things as you, you do. And uh, I would like <laughs> to say first that I sign up to both my colleagues said before, and I, I would say not exactly the same, but uh, to bring uh, some additions to that. First of all, we, are, we, we must remain committed, it was said. We must remain committed in a world where our societies are in total confusion. We are in confusion because individualism is more important now than collective issues, than uh, solidarity, and also for uh, one reason, that we are in a transition of generation, which is a key question, a key problem. Uh, I belong to a generation which is the first who didn't make war to the Germans. Um, my children don't have any clue of what it means. I guess in this room there are plenty of former freedom strugglers. I doubt their children know exactly what it meant to combat for one's freedom. So this is, I would say, the thread of history which has been lost, and that adds to the confusion. Then we have uncertainties on the international stage. That's the question of multilateralism. Unilateral actions and uh, all kinds of initiatives put multilateralism at stake, and that is a key issue because principles and rules which were respected since the time of post-war and the time of post-independence are lost of sight, and we must work on it. It be on trade, it be on arms control, it be on clim climate and everything. 
Then there is another challenge, which is inequalities. And you were hinting at it. Inequalities uh, because of globalization, which has adjusted and realigned economies in the world, which has uplifted huge masses of people out from poverty, but also has disenfranchised lots of parts in societies. You were hinting at the yellow vests, mm -hmm. or yellow jackets we have in France at the moment. This is part of this transition of generation and also of this need for something new, something different. And we are working on it with this vast debate organized by uh, our uh, officials. Um, we have systems which have been built at a time societies were very different. Now, how do people feel represented and others? And I jumped onto the other question, which is uh, the other challenge, which is the youth. I guess my colleagues here travel a lot, and we talk with many, I would say, leaders and uh, responsible officials in many countries, and the major question which arises always is, what shall we do with our youth? Can you work together for having uh, vocational training, skills, and this and that? These are key issues. The youth of today is the game changer because the transition of generation, because we have to rebuild the world and be committed to something global that works. How can we do it? There are all the possibilities which were described. Of course, to work on the existing formats with, uh, of course, international bodies, but also try to work on this, the, the ones which are in competition. Uh, the, the Chinese initiatives have been mentioned. We must work on that as well. We must uh, outreach the, 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 the current formats of G7. Is G7 still relevant? We saw last year in Canada what happened. So this year we shall invite other countries, we invite India to talk, uh, to talk about artificial intelligence, about digital, these are major issues of our world. We shall invite China to talk about trade. We shall try to connect more the, 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 the topics of G20 and G7. This is crucial. We must work also on regional cooperation. Regional cooperation remains in the globalized world a key issue, and we must work on it. And then we must try to find out how we can set up sort of, I would call them coalitions of the willings, of the ones who want and will do something together. And I would take the example of what we do with India, and uh, my, uh, my, my colleague and friend Mark said will uh, give an example for Britain, but the same for us. We, we must work, we work with India as a country which is democratic, which is democracy, which is, and it will be shown, we were talking about the Electoral Commission, how this is organized, this is a, an exemplary for the rest of the world, uh, also which respects the rule of law. We must work with a partner which has a strategic trust, and we work on that. The Indo-Pacific Partnership is a good example for that. And we must work also on public goods, climate, so this, this Solar International a a Alliance is something which is exemplary as well. So, I don't know whether I should tell what are the predictions. My predictions are not so good for the next 10 years. It's difficult to predict anyway, because I was in Germany at the time the, the Berlin Wall fell, and I remember three months before, no one had a clue, an idea that it would happen. I was in Britain uh, just before the financial crisis, three months in advance, no one thought it would be of that magnitude. And uh, let's remember the Arab Springs. Uh, so this is open. But I would say first that the the more narrow, the narrower the, the mindset of the people regarding, of the countries regarding the national interest is, the more complicated it will be. It will be the backdrop to international life. Second, we, we need to, to work on, uh, on, uh, on what is the so-called fragmentation of the world. The world will remain fragmented, hence the necessity to find out groupings to tackle with issues which are crucial in a globalized world which will remain global. And the, 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 what President Macron always said, says is that we are more sovereign when we are many and together than if we are alone. That's something which is, which is to be kept in mind. And my third prediction would be the ability to, for the European Union to reform itself. I am a great believer. I think that uh, uh, we are going through difficult times. We shall have these elections to the European Parliament in May, which big stakes with all these uh, populist movements, which are reactions to the, to the world as it is today. We, we have not to deny or denigate what it is. But we must work on it, and we must reform and go ahead, because this regional integration, which has preserved peace 
and stability for many decades is still there. I talk near my good friend Mark Sedwell, I must say, regarding France and Britain, the closeness of our relationship, this neighborhood we have had through thousand years will remain, and we have so many commonalities in defense and security, in energy and all that. So I think there are plenty of possibilities. Let's remain committed, let's remain open-minded, and the world will continue to be developed. All three of you have, in some ways, um, used the term multilateralism and a rules-based order, the global order. And somehow you have assumed that, A, that there is a single rules-based order, uh, although I believe Mr. Gokhale did mention that uh, there, is a, there are different multilateralisms at play today. Uh, and many of you have also assumed that there is a rules-based order that applies to some new spaces. You mentioned that cyberspace is now a place, but there are no rules for that place. So how effective is that rules-based order that we keep invoking as a term for these new spaces or places as you define them, or even for the new geographies where increasing wealth is now concentrated, which have traditionally had institutions that lag behind the Atlantic system. Uh, can I start with you, Mark? Um, well, well, thank you. Um, I mean, I think, I think the, key, the key point about the rules-based uh, order is that, as I said, it's, at its core, it's about the rule of law, but it's a global rule of law. And it's essentially nations, however they organize themselves internally, their political systems, their economic systems, their stage of development, respect some common rules about how we deal with each other and how we deal with common threats. And so uh, there's then the broader rules-based system, which would include, um, for example, the Paris Climate Change Agreement, where we've, mm -hmm. we've agreed essentially a common approach across the globe to deal with a, to deal with a, global, uh, a global challenge. But it is critical that we remember that we do, need, we do need those basics of governance um, in an increasingly globalized world if we're to be able to enable our citizens to prosper but also to stay safe. And in particular, uh, in the modern world, in the 21st century, uh, to be able to stay safe online. Because as we know from the UK, but uh, uh, colleagues here will have experienced it as well, um, criminal or terrorist threats, for example, can reach right through cyberspace from some part of ungoverned space, whether it's um, uh, somewhere in Syria or in the past in other uh, parts of this region, right into our own communities uh, and radicalize and criminalize people in our own communities. So you can only deal with those kind of threats through, through partnerships. Whether those are partnerships in an organized multilateral set of mechanisms, whether it's the UN or the G20 or the G7 or uh, other regional groupings, sometimes that will be the case, um, or whether it's more informal coalitions mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the willing. Uh, where it's necessary for countries that share uh, a, 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 a deeper set of commonalities to, uh, 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 to, to deepen their partnerships uh, 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 on an issue will vary, I think, from issue to issue. But for cyberspace, cyberspace in the 21st century is like international waters in the 18th century, and it has to be governed, um, because otherwise um, it will put our citizens at risk. And of course, as uh, Mr. Gockley was saying earlier, the governance of that and the nations shaping the governance of that um, need to reflect uh, the, uh, the 21st century and not the system as it evolved in the middle of the 20th, let alone, uh, let alone uh, before that. And we need to do that collectively. So in a more nativist world, in a more world that seeks individual gains rather than collective benefits, sir, do you think that this rules-based order or writing of new rules for spaces such as cyberspace is a possibility in the immediate future. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with Mark more on this, but I think the crux is how those rules will be written and by whom they will be written. I think uh, really in the 21st century for the world in general, but for us Indians in particular, if we cannot write the rules of the game, it doesn't matter whether it's space, cyber, or any other place, we will actually be reduced to a follower. Uh, you take the example of the telecom industry. We are not part of 2G, 3G, 4G, and yet we're the biggest buyers of mobile phones in the world. Billions and billions of, Indian, of dollars are being spent by Indians buying somebody else's technology written on somebody else's rules. 
it's time that we became part of that rulemaking process. It's only when we become part of that rulemaking process that we will actually be able to influence uh, uh, global events. Of course, that begs the question, will we be allowed to become part of the uh, rulemaking process? And that's where I think that the current system of multilateralism just doesn't work. It's, whether it's the UN Security Council, whether it's the WTO or any other institution, it has to reflect today's realities. And today's reality is that India, in terms of population, in terms of um, location, in terms of economy, uh, in whatever manner you look at it, in terms of intellectual property for that matter, we are not, uh, our position is not reflective in multilateral institutions. And therefore, we must continue to press for that. But for that, we have to be ready domestically to uh, develop the expertise to write those rules in those sectors. We cannot be expected to go to conferences and not be able to articulate national positions on this. But I cannot emphasize the importance of uh, our participating in a rules-based order and, the, and the, the problems the world will face, uh, particularly in an unregulated cyber uh, situation, if there are no rules-based orders. Mr. Mo uh, Mr. Godot Montagne, uh, let me ask you a question. I think just taking off from what the Foreign Secretary said, uh, India's, many other countries need to be on the, on the table that uh, writes those rules. Many of those believe that we are made to adhere to rules. Uh, we are sought to, uh, in many ways, underwrite that rules-based order, but we are not invited. Uh, it, uh, you know, we, are, we are not holding the pen that shapes those rules. And this is a common grouse we've heard for a while now. Do you think EU and, and uh, some of the G7 that you invoked in your previous comments are now ready to accept that there will be new actors holding the pen and writing rules that perhaps the Atlantic system may have to enter in the future. Definitely, definitely we, we are in a world, it was said by Mr. Anwar Ibrahim, that uh, uh, the, 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 the West is no longer the driving side of the world. And so we have now to adapt and to reorganize the world and the international system. I think uh, my colleague Vijay Gokhale said it rightly. Uh, if you are not at the table and if you don't write, uh, who are you actually? You will be imposed the system. That's why for the last 15 years, France has been defending a permanent seat uh, of, for India at the Security Council. And if you look at the projections of force of India in OPEX and all that, it perfectly justified, not only for that, but because of the strength of India on the international stage. We think that some other countries do it. Whether this will be the reform which will be done, it's another matter, but we must launch the debate again so that things are changed. When we look at the EU, EU as such talks with India as a major partner. We have uh, trade agreements, we have lots of conversations, lots of dialogues of all kinds, and decisions which are taken on a foot of equality. So this is an example. So I think we are on the trend of a world which will need more than ever these kind of things. And partnerships, I, we were mentioning the Indo-Pacific uh, Indo uh, strategic partnership. This is something to which we stick very much. We have this strategic partnership with India, which is developing now with other partners. We were, I would say, the cradle. We set up the cradle for that in the past on a foot of equality. So I think this is the world of tomorrow. There are no powers who will impose on others their will, and of not only their political will, but also we need to share standards and norms. Who will decide for the standards and norms? And this is a debate which is even above all that. If we look on the at the organization which are in charge of standards and norms, uh, there, the Chinese are very, very active. The mm -hmm. Europeans mm -hmm. are almost nowhere. So we have to think of that. Maybe we have to think of that with the Indians. We have to think of that with the Chinese themselves. We have to commit more in these, uh, on this, in, in these bodies. So I think there are plenty of possibilities because the world is changing. Let me open this up to um, all of you now. Uh, let me first go to the young fellows. If some of you want to pose a question, uh, this is the last chance for you to do so uh, at the Ricina. Uh, can you walk to the mics uh, and we will probably bunch them up, sir, with your permission? I'll make a note so that I can remember all the questions. Uh, let's go to uh, the, the Raisina Young Fellow first, please, sir. And okay. then to the lady here. We'll start with the Raisina Young Fellow. Yeah, go ahead. A very good evening. Uh, I'm Commander Arjit Pandey from the Indian Navy. I'm also a Young Fellow, as just brought out. Uh, my question is that uh, in light of the predicted developments in the emerging world reorder, in the run-up to 2030, 
what is the uh, assessment or what are the thoughts of the distinguished panelists on how close will the world get to achieving the 17 uh, you know sustainment uh, development goals which have been formulated by the united nations thank you uh, the lady here please uh, hi good evening my name is anushka i'm from the national law school bangalore um, my question is open to the panel how do you see indian foreign policy changing should there be a change in the government this year <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy one, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me go to the youngster there, yeah. So I want and to we, will let, we will let our guests from UK and France answer that. <laughs> I want to make addressee uh, Videsh Sachi Sarji. Uh, sir, you mentioned in your third, uh, during the issues where you were talking about very uh, briefly, and the third point was science versus ethics. So, is there a is there a probability or is there a, uh, anyhow you're talking that science has lost ethics or the science has divorced the ethics? This is the question from the theoretical area. And secondly, sir, it's always better to prevent a disease rather than curing it. So we have our regional problems here. So can we expect a two plus two dialogue or maybe adding two more chair, four plus four dialogue uh, including Pakistan? That's my question, sir. Okay. I think regional, regional issues, domestic policy and foreign policy will be clashing in next times. So that's, that's why I asked this question, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, let me ask that young lady to ask the next question, please. Good evening, uh, honorable panelists. Uh, my question is, as uh, mentioned by the panelists, the, in this era of uh, Industry 4.0, in this era of jobless growth, we have to make sure growth and social stability go hand in hand. And as mentioned, we have to make sure science is coherent with ethics. Uh, in such a situation, how can we combine environmental and social sustainability with economic stability to produce business model and technology? Uh, can you introduce yourself? Uh, Pratyusha Paramita. Uh, from? Uh, from Royal Bank of Scotland. I am an, I'm a senior analyst there. OK, thank you. And, and the last question for this round. Yeah, Please. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Aprajita Agnihotri. I am a master's student. I've, I'm pursuing master's in environmental studies. However, my friend has already asked a question on environment, so I'll chuck that out from my question. <laughs> so um, we have been talking about uh, protectionism and post-truth politics for a while now. Um, so my question is, how would it affect, A, the social world order? Would it deepen the present cleavages? And B, how would it impact the process of economic globalization and related multilateral institutions? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that's enough for this round. We have, we have five of them. Uh, we'll try and come back to you. Uh, I think there are two questions on the SDGs and the environmental agenda and how does the current world order allow us to meet those obligations to people and to the planet. Uh, there is a question, of course, on the Indian foreign policy for the two of you, sir. Um, <laughs> there is, uh, uh, there is a, uh, I think there's an interesting question that is science divorced from ethics uh, since we make this um, assertion. And finally, I think the social stability and the economic globalization, are, you know, is globalization possible when you see social instability and this uh, populist pushback? Uh, would you like to start, sir? Let's start so, with you this time. So these are very vast questions for a long seminar of many days. But uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, oh, SDGs, we are on. It's a long track. It's a long way. There are lots of contributions. I think we are progressing. We are progressing in the field of health, of edu healthcare, education, uh, sustainable development, um, endowment of, of countries. So there are reports on a regular basis, but I can tell you that a country like France and the countries of the European Union are, uh, I would say, sticking to the uh, SDGs for the future. But it is, uh, I would say, an iterative process. And we add to these SDGs more and more goals Climate was not there. Climate is in the SDGs now. So in fact, this is a globalized approach, more and more globalized approach, which is reflected by the SDGs, which remain, I would say, the, the line to, 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 to follow. Then, other questions? Uh, the populist uh, pushback the, the, and economic yes, globalization? Populi of course, when you have inequalities in societies, because of globalization, I say it roughly, of course, this generates tensions. And when you have tensions in societies, of course, it's a big challenge for the, for the governments to address. So it can generate also 
tensions between countries, because in fact the, the impatience of the people to, to change the order as it is can, be, uh, can degenerate in a way. So we have to tackle these issues. That's why at the G7, uh, the next G7, President Macron has decided that the, the, the issue of inequalities is not only an issue for internally in our countries, but it's an issue also which must be dealt with at the, at the uh, most widely uh, at the level of the planet with the reinforcement. I come back to the first topic, which are uh, SDGs to be fulfilled and so on and so forth. That's what I, would, I could add. Um, sir, would you like to come? Thank you. Well, just, I mean, just, on the, just on the first point about the SDGs, I agree with uh, 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 Maurice's point. Um, I think we are on track. We achieved, um, we, we, we almost achieved the MDGs and we almost achieved them uh, on time. The SDGs have broadened uh, that out. I think when we look at development, and we're one of the countries that meets the 0.7% target of, of our gross national income uh, on development, so we have a, we have a very, uh, 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 this, is, this, is, this is a big, uh, uh, a big part of our global presence alongside the more traditional hard and diplomatic power and so on. And, and what we're trying to do, and we're particularly trying this now in some of our development aid in Africa, for example, is to bring together our uh, commercial expertise with classic development aid. In other words, helping countries generate the jobs themselves, particularly for the younger generation, that they are going to need to have sustainable and prosperous economies um, themselves. So it is about marrying um, government intervention, development aid, expertise, and so on, with um, uh, empowering and enabling uh, private sector and particularly jobs-related growth. Uh, and that, I think, is going to, that, that model, um, we think, is going to be a major part of achieving uh, the, the broad range of the SDGs. Because, of course, if people have jobs uh, they and, and greater wealth, they become more economically empowered, they tend to become more politically empowered, and their concerns, um, and the concerns of the rising generation around climate change, around the environment, whether it's plastics in the oceans, whatever it might be, will then become more and more uh, an important part of those countries' uh, of those countries' political agenda. Um, on the question of the fourth industrial revolution, jobless growth, and uh, uh, the related questions of disaffection, I don't think we should assume the fourth industrial rev revolution will mean job jobless growth. Every industrial revolution we've had so far, of course, caused uh, losers in the short run. Uh, in the UK, where the first industrial revolution really uh, began, we had the Luddite movement, which broke up uh, the machines that were replacing the jobs uh, of that time. But in the end, uh, new technology generates new job opportunities. And the task for governments in particular uh, is to enable our populations and citizens uh, 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 throughout our countries and throughout all, all cohorts of our citizens to benefit from those. That is going to mean a huge challenge in education and training and retraining. In Western countries, uh, we have a significant challenge with dependency ratios as we have aging populations. People are going to have to work for longer, and they won't be working in the same jobs for 40 years that was the case in the mid-20th century. So they're going to have to, people are going to have to retrain and adapt. Change is going to be the new norm. Uh, and the challenge for governments is to equip people to do that so they can have fulfilling uh, work and therefore make a fulfilling contribution uh, to, uh, to their societies and to uh, economic growth. And in terms of uh, partnerships and, and regulation of cyberspace, one of the earlier issues we were talking about, um, so you made the point of how do we get invited to the table? Well, of course, you can set the table. Um, you know, the UK and India uh, have uh, one, of, one of our areas of most promising economic cooperation mm -hmm. is in the digital and service economy. We're actually integrating very quickly in that area and growing that part of our uh, bilateral economic partnership quickly. So why not? Uh, you, we can, uh, uh, as two democracies of very different traditions, very different sizes, uh, very different uh, 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 economic uh, shapes, work together to start defining the conversation and start defining uh, some of those rules. And if you want a prediction about Indian foreign policy <laughs> with the Indian foreign secretary sitting next to me, I think it will be in uh, the kind of partnerships under whatever government uh, is elected uh, that we've been discussing that India will, India will play a very, prominent, uh, a very prominent role. Sir, can I turn to you? Yeah, I just want to add one word on the SDGs. I want to remind those who were here when external affairs minister spoke yesterday 
ultimately the success or failure of SDGs will depend on whether India can achieve those goals. I Correct. think to that extent, it, it, it behooves us as a government, as citizens, as businesses, uh, and as, as society to see that we fulfill these SDG goals, otherwise the world isn't going to achieve them by 2030. Um, so far as science and ethics are, con are concerned, I think it needs a, a much greater discussion. Science is basically ethical. It is when that science becomes technology that you have the profit motive. And that's when uh, there seems to be an ungoverned space as to what should be uh, marketed and marketable and what its impact is on society. It's something which is still very new but it is something which can have devastating effect if it is not regulated. And then the question is who will regulate it? Because then it comes, on the one hand, there are those who speak of civil liberties. On the other hand, if you go and regulate it, uh, there could be accusations that you, know, you are running a, a 1984 state. So I think that's an issue we really need to discuss. Uh, one point I wanted to make on, on foreign policy, I, uh, the, the chairman of our standing committee on external affairs is here. I think there is a broad consensus in India for the past 70 years. Foreign policy is determined by India's uh, determination to maintain its decisional and strategic autonomy. In the earlier part of our time, it worked with non-alignment. We've moved beyond that. I think at this stage we are aligned, but the alignment is issue-based. It's not ideological. That gives us the capacity to be flexible. It gives us the capacity to, to, uh, uh, to maintain our decisional autonomy. At the same time, we are not the India of the 1950s and 60s. We have big stakes in all parts of the world and on all issues co uh, concerning the world. And therefore, we ought, in my view, to align with groups, with countries, uh, with issues where national interest is involved. You know, yesterday night we were at a closed door dinner and, uh, and I, it was under Chattermouth's rules, but I'm going to break that for a small question. Uh, the foreign secretary very kindly said at the end of that dinner that I'm going to take this feedback from all of you this evening and implement it. Now, since both of you are here, if you were to have a, a couple of suggestions for India's role in the world going ahead, since you have come to Raisina Dialogue, the foreign secretary is in a kind mood these days. If you think we should be doing a couple of things, it's time to say it now. Can I start with you, uh, 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 the secretary general from France? You know, that's uh, difficult. How could, give could I give advice to India after what has, uh, the, the, the Foreign Secretary has said? India is an autonomous country. We, we, we stick to our autonomy. We stick to our self-sufficiency. We stick to be independent. That's why France and India, for, since the independence, have been close together. I remember General de Gaulle's policy was uh, very much uh, fitting with uh, the way uh, India has itself developed its own policy. So. The right point is that whenever you want to have a say, come and sit and force the door and sit at the table. That's the only thing I say. <laughs> Mark, would you like to have? I agree. No, I, I mean, actually, I was going to make exactly that, that, final, uh, that final point. India is a major global player now. It's always been an important country. It's a major, major global player uh, now. And uh, uh, exactly as uh, uh, my friend Vijay was setting out, has the opportunity to shape the global order of the 21st century. It's the world's greatest, la greatest and largest democracy, um, and it's in the interests of other countries like mine, but m like France and others, that India is playing that role uh, wholeheartedly um, in shaping that new global order. I'm going to close this conversation. I know there are people standing next to the mic. Unfortunately, time's up. The clock's flashing. That's that clock is something that I commissioned, so I have to follow that. Uh, but let me ask you one last question, a quick word, uh, not thought through. I know you're all diplomats, so you're going to think about the words. But all of you mentioned, there was a trepidation when you mentioned youth, society, demography. Is that something that's crucial over the next 10 years? How it evolves, how it changes, how it chooses? I, I, I firmly believe that India is going to set an example for, for the world in terms of democracy. Uh, as the most diverse country probably on earth, uh, I don't believe that uh, uh, any Indian uh, believes that uh, uh, there is any alternative to democracy. And I think every five years we show it, uh, and we are going to show it again in 2019. I'm absolutely confident of that. So, <laughs> final word. Um, we've talked about there are going to be different partnerships in the 21st century, and the democratic nations, whatever their traditions, will naturally align uh, 
uh, with each other on a whole range of issues. But it won't just be those nations. Um, and as I said, there will be different alliances. Whatever the, whatever the institutional arrangements, there will be different alliances. Uh, and the key requirement is however countries organize themselves, are they committed to the global rule of law? If they are, certainly my country is willing to be in partnership uh, with them. Um, uh, but they do need to be because that's how we keep the, 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 wor the world economy growing and, uh, and global security um, uh, uh, solid. Well, my last word would be that you mentioned the youth. Uh, in fact, the world, this, the world means countries, means people, and nowadays means youth. Youth with huge expectations. We are on a trend of fragmentation and withdrawing on oneself. So the more we bet on partnerships, exchange, and mobility, the more we know the other ones, the better it will be. And we must work at it. So I think all of us have voted here for more democracy, more integration, more globalization. Yes. And certainly, there's hope, both around the innovation space, if you can get it right, and certainly uh, the young societies choosing the right pathways for the future. Please join me in applauding this fantastic panel for their interventions this evening. Uh, since uh, we did away with uh, uh, the more traditional last segment called the vote of thanks, I'm going to use this mic here to, to just say a few thanks uh, uh, to, to the people who made this possible. Uh, I think uh, one, uh, what we, uh, the term we use in American baseball, the most valuable player, I think the most valuable player uh, at this Raisina dialogue should be recognized. Can I invite uh, Gadam Dharmendra? from the Ministry of External Affairs, who was certainly the MVP to join us on stage. <laughs>